begin and uh, by welcoming all those folks that are here to join us as we discuss public health and how essential public health is for oral health, especially now. And we're looking at, at public health from a broad perspective, not just uh, looking at community clinics, but looking at what are the interactions between health professionals that we're learning and have learned are so critically important to improve the health we serve. And we were so fortunate today to have leaders in our profession, the healthcare profession, that are going to address some of these issues with us and make you aware of opportunities that all of you have, whether you're physicians, dentists, dental hygienists, therapists, healthcare workers that have the opportunity, we're smart enough to pick this topic to listen to during this Greater New York Dental Meeting. I, I believe you're gonna come away with new information and some energy that's gonna help you succeed, whether it be working with in, people with intellectual developmental disabilities or the disabled or those individuals that need to understand you have a role to do that. And we're gonna start off with two of my favorite people. And these are uh, two nurses. Uh, two professors, Judy Haber and Aaron Hartnett, both at NYU, both pioneers and leaders um, throughout the health industry in showing the importance of bringing in the other health professionals into the oral health world and vice versa so that we can work together to improve health. And they have done it in an incredible way. I encourage you to look at articles they've written Google them and see some of the wonderful work that NYU has done leading the way. And, and Judy in particular with the Santa Fe group and other leadership organizations and think tanks in this country and Aaron as well, how they've been able to do that. And then we're going to hear from uh, Steve Perlman who is another one of my heroes who has really pioneered the work integrating oral health into the world of those individuals with special health care needs, whether they be intellectually developmentally disabled, disabled, or those engaged in special Olympics. He is the one that brought dental care into the world of Special Olympics that has broadened now to overall health. And I encourage all of you that are watching, if you're not engaged working with individuals with special needs, this is an opportunity to learn. This is an opportunity for you to get great satisfaction and make a positive difference in the life of some critically underserved people. No matter what country you're in or city you're in, uh, you're gonna take away some wonderful knowledge from today's presentation. So let me start it off, if I may. Uh, Judy, are you gonna start this off today? Uh, well, I'm going to give a, a brief who we are and then yes. over to Aaron. Um, I'm Judy Haber and I'm a professor at NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. And Aaron and I lead a national nursing oral health initiative funded by the DentaQuest and our Cora Foundations and it's called Oral Health Nursing Education and Practice Program, fondly called ONEP. Some of you may be on our email blast list and get our frequent uh, communications um, about what's doing in oral health. And our goal, the aim of the ONEP program is to integrate oral health to undergraduate and graduate nursing programs throughout the country and to establish best practices in oral health that get integrated into the healthcare provided by nurses and others in clinical settings. So our work while called nursing quickly becomes interprofessional. And I'm going to um, ask Erin to uh, take the ball and move this forward to talk about how and why that happens and is so important. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jack and Judy. So I'd just like to start by explaining what our model is. This is a model that we borrowed from the World Health Organization's interprofessional care model. And we've called it our interprofessional oral health care model. So we believe that we have a serious, we have serious oral health needs in this country, 
as well as a fragmented oral health system. So we also believe that if we just educate all of the healthcare professions, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, PAs, pharmacists, we can build a primary care oral health workforce. And then we need to help them learn interprofessional competencies and interprofessional collaboration so that, that together they will be able to increase access to oral health care. And through this access, we will be able to reduce oral health disparities and improve overall health as well as oral health. So that's basically what we base our work on. So if you look at the primary care workforce, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, physician assistants, and you look at the different amount of visits people have, you can see 84% of adults have an annual medical visit and only 64% have an annual dental visit. So there's a 20% difference right there in how many people are actually seeing a medical versus a dental provider. In addition to an annual visit, we have 89 million people go for an urgent care visit and visits to medical providers are much higher for people in the older age group over 65 because they have many more comorbidities conditions. And children also are seeing uh, primary care providers. They have about 12 visits before they're even age three. So this gives primary care providers an excellent opportunity to begin to integrate oral health into overall health. And if you look at the providers, nursing is the largest health profession. There are 4 million RNs over 250,000 nurse practitioners and almost 12,000 midwives. We have a million physicians and DOs and we have 115,000 PAs. And compare that we only have 200,419 dentists. So we really should help you guys out a bit. There's so many more of us and you can't, really do it all. So hopefully we can be of some help. That's great. So if you look at oral health and overall health, there is, um, right now, everyone believes that there is an oral systemic connection. And especially in the conditions I've put here, in cardiovascular disease, new research shows there's a strong correlation between oral bacteria found in the periodontal disease and many heart-related diseases. Studies suggest that it's an inflammatory response to the oral bacteria. This creates the formation or contributes to the formation of plaque, which leads to cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. When it comes to pulmonary disease, according to the Centers for Disease Control, people with chronic periodontal disease are most affected by pneumonia. Therefore, improving the state of poor oral health may reduce the number of pneumonia cases that we have, especially in the elderly. And periodontal disease also affects 20 to 50% of pregnant women. And although there's not a cause and effect, there is a relationship between periodontal disease, low birth weight, and prematurity, which is also thought to be related to the increase in um, inflammatory markers. And Judy will discuss <clears throat> uh, diabetes. So HPV, is another very important oral systemic infection, human papillomavirus. It is the most common sexually transmitted infection. 
of US adults have had an HPV infection and it's the leading cause of oral cancer. Actually, 70% of oropharyngeal cancer is caused by HPV. Previously, oral cancers were found in older males who had alcohol and tobacco use, but now we are seeing it in much younger patients. Now it's more common in a non-smoking male between the age of 35 and 55. But we do have a vaccine. The HPV vaccine that has been given to teenage girls and now young boys, since it was introduced, it has decreased the prevalence of anogenital HPV infection 56% in teenage girls. So now, as of June 2020, the FDA has approved the use of Gardasil, Gardasil 9, an HPV vaccine for the prevention of oropharyngeal and head and neck cancer. This is approved under an accelerated approval basis and a clinical trial is underway, but it's up to us as primary care providers and also our dental colleagues to make sure that our teenage patients are getting it. They can start at age nine and they get two shots if they're between age nine and 14, six months apart. And if they start over age 15, they can get it up till age 45, but then they need three shots. So we need to promote this vaccine, especially to parents as an anti-cancer vaccine so that they will become more comfortable and accepting of it. So thank you. Let Judy start now. Okay, thanks, Erin. And um, there are so many chronic diseases as Erin just showed on the previous um, overall uh, oral systemic connection slide diabetes being one of them. If you think about it, about 10% of the population, overall population in the US has diabetes, about 34 million adults. It is a national epidemic and it's related to many factors, not just one factor. Obesity being one of the contributors to the recent increase, dramatic increase in the incidence and prevalence of type 2 diabetes. But what we know is there's probably the strongest oral systemic connection uh, in terms of evidence linking diabetes and oral health. So we know that the, the relationship is a bi-directional one. So that we know that from the primary care side of the equation, um, poor glycemic control is associated with an increased risk of periodontal disease. The underlying pathophysiology is the inflammatory cascade, um, as Erin mentioned earlier. We know that patients who are dental patients and are having a dental checkup and have um, evidence of periodontal disease. There is evidence to support that the majority of them are either pre-diabetic or have undiagnosed or diagnosed diabetes. And so that patients with periodontal disease are twice as likely to develop diabetes. There's a huge contribution to be made by both the primary care workforce, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, registered nurses, pharmacists too, um, as well as the entire dental team uh, in managing diabetes effectively, a true oral systemic partnership. Because we know that the treatment of periodontal disease results in a 10 to 25% improvement in glycemic control. That is pretty dramatic. And we know that when physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants 
work with their patients, their primary care patients using motivational interviewing, medication management that improve glycemic control, weight loss, exercise, the behavioral lifestyle changes, all contribute to improved glycemic control, which we see in, in the dental office as an improvement in periodontal disease as well. Oral hygiene is an important part of the entire process and oral health literacy in both the primary care practice setting and in the dental setting are essential to helping patients understand and increase their motivation to both improve their oral hygiene, engaging in effective twice a day, at least oral hygiene, um, practices, as well as in managing their uh, medication, their diet, their exercise, and their weight. And there are so many symptoms of diabetes, like altered taste, xerostomia, burning mouth, um, decreased saliva production. In addition to periodontal disease, that can be presented as symptoms in the primary care office. And what is the action to take when it is something that cannot be managed on the primary care side, but a referral to the dental home and making sure that a patient has a dental home. So it is one of the most important partnerships, like Erin was saying about HPV. HPV and diabetes are two of the most important partnerships uh, the dental team and the primary care team can forge to improve both oral health and overall health outcomes. Next slide, Erin. And when you think of the impact of COVID-19 on oral health, um, the oral bacterial load that Erin mentioned, and you mentioned too, Jack, the accumulation of bacteria in the oral cavity from tooth decay, accumulation of plaque, inflammation, infection in the gums, um, or just plain old poor oral hygiene. All of those factors increase the risk for pneumonia. We know that with COVID-19, the most common serious um, symptom and condition that has uh, contributed to the highest morbidity and mortality is pneumonia, COVID-19 pneumonia. And what happens is that the bacteria in the oral, oral biofilm travels from the mouth to the lungs where they are aspirated and the periodontal disease enzymes, TNF, IL-8 and others, alter the mucosal surfaces of the lungs to allow for the oral pathogens to grab onto the mucosa um, in the respiratory epithelium. And these are the same inflammatory <clears throat> markers already heightened in COVID-19 and contribute to the coronavirus back, um, pneumonia and the cytokine storm that just is the blow up of inflammation during this um, condition and contributes to the high mortality rate. The bottom line is that people who have poor oral hygiene to begin with, and whether it's from tooth decay, periodontal disease, or all of them, they are at high risk for the secondary infections associated with COVID-19. And we know that aside from COVID-19, that the non-ventilator hospital acquired pneumonia is the most common infection, hospital acquired infection in, in adults 70 and older and has a high level of morbidity and mortality, not to mention increased cost related to complications and increased length of stay. So overall, we know that once COVID patients are on ventilators, we know that oral hygiene, oral care is a major evidence-based component of the VAP bundle. 
um, and decreases the risk for hospital um, acquired as well as ventilator acquired pneumonia. So um, oral hygiene is important. It is a very important aspect of overall health care. We see the impact of COVID-19 on oral health. And during the um, pandemic, our ONEP program, Erin, myself, and our program coordinator, Jessamine Cipollina, have um, disseminated numerous emails and other information uh, increasing the health literacy to support the importance of oral hygiene while dental offices were closed and to stress the importance of staying connected with everybody's dental provider and practice. And as soon as the um, closure of dental offices was over, we urged people while the COVID levels were lower, low in many areas, um, to hurry to their dental office and that it was safe and that they shouldn't be hesitant. And the PPE um, leadership that dental offices have provided during COVID has really been outstanding. So it has been a great partnership of a different kind. Next slide, Erin. So in a nutshell, we think that the oral health delivery framework that was developed by um, Qualys Health in 2015 is a very simple one for primary care providers to think about as they integrate oral health into overall health. They need to think about oral health when they are collecting the health history and ask questions about people's oral health, beginning with, do you have a dentist? And when was your last dental checkup? They need to examine, include the intraoral cavity using the he not approach, head, ears, eyes, nose, oral cavity, throat, uh, to look for signs that indicate a risk for oral health problems and whether it's inflamed gums, bleeding gums, loose wiggly teeth or oral lesions or evidence of xerostomia. Those are the observations and the health assessment um, indicators that help primary care clinicians decide on the most appropriate response that lead them to the most appropriate actions in terms of integrating oral health into their management plan. And whether it is medication, whether it is behavioral lifestyle changes, whether it is oral health literacy, or referral to a dental home or to remind them that they need to visit their dental home, um, all of the above are important actions that by primary care providers that offer preventive interventions and or referrals for treatment by their partners in the dental office. And then most important and finally, and probably the biggest barrier to progress is documentation. We lack integrated electronic health records that talk to each other from the dental office to the primary care office and vice versa. And that is a frontier for the future. But in the meantime, there are many primary care offices that have integrated a customized oral field, a required oral field for documentation of oral health assessment findings and interventions. And so even if our EHRs don't speak to each other, we can respectively include oral health from the primary care side of practice and include oral health, overall health on the oral health side of dental practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy and Erin. I mean, a wealth of information, critically important. And for those of you watching us today, before I turn it over to Steve, I want you to just 
you know, realize the opportunity you have to reach out in your communities to nurse practitioners, to nurses, and, and have the conversation. Uh, and you can be a critical uh, component and catalyst to improve this dialogue. Uh, the research is there, the data is there. I think we have an opportunity to really make a profound difference in improving overall health by furthering integration of overall health and uh, oral health. So uh, again, uh, Judy, and thank you so very much. Very informative, very important, the work you do. And one of the things, you, when you talk about pneumonia, there is a pneumonia vaccine, which I received recently, now that right. I'm approaching 75. And I think that, you know, people didn't realize, and for those of you watching, may not realize, get your flu shot for sure. That's critical. Mm -hmm. But also, if you are an older person, have an older family member, realize that pneumonia is a critical uh, potential cause of Ill, severe illness and death, and the vaccine is available. The, the, the pneumonia 23, especially for the older folks, is, is uh, covered by most insurance, including Medicare. Please check it out uh, just because it, it's there and it'll protect and uh, it's important. So now let's move on uh, to an area that's near and dear to me, as well, and that is uh, working with our uh, people with disabilities and those with intellectual developmental disabilities, young and old, throughout this country. And really, we're just so fortunate to have one of the pioneers in this and someone who has dedicated his life as a pediatric dentist, uh, even though he's up in Boston, I still stay friends with him. And it's a matter of what he's able to do on a regular basis to improve the oral health of people with disabilities. Okay, thanks, Jack. Can you hear uh, me? Yep. Yeah, now you froze for a second, but thank you for the opportunity of presenting with my colleagues on interdisciplinary care and working with you for 40 years in the field of public health and dentistry. So basically, um, I saw as a private practicing um, clinician and as a acad academician, I saw that nobody was really moving the bar in healthcare and dental care, access to dental care for people with children and adults with intellectual disabilities. And any study, you know, God knows we can save the money on the studies because the 40 years that you and I have worked together, it's the same thing. And um, many of these public health organizations, they can save the money on the bagels and the coffee and the notepads and everything because all they do is talk about the problems and nobody ever moved the bar. So partnering with an organization like Special Olympics, which has a million athletes in the US and 5 million athletes glo globally, I saw that I could use it as a bully pulpit to move the bar forward. So when I started bring, so bringing health into a sports organization, the first thing we had to do was show the world that there was a need, that there were disparities in, in healthcare for people in those days, the term was mental retardation. So in 1999, we went to Yale, um, Tim Shriver and, uh, and a few people went to Yale because they thought that that was the best public health program in the world. And they hired um, the famous people, um, Horowitz and Ziegler at Ziegler to do the first ever report on health disparities for people with intellectual disabilities. This is a copy of the book. It's 150 pages. This is the complete work of health disparities for people with intellectual disabilities up until the year 2000. How pathetic is this? It showed that we didn't need, we didn't know anything about the healthcare and, and access to healthcare for people with intellectual disabilities. So we took that document and got the first ever Senate hearing on health disparities for people with intellectual disabilities, which was held at the Special Olympic World Winter Games in Anchorage, Alaska in 2001. And at that uh, Senate hearing, uh, who was the who's who um, in Congress and, and all the federal agencies, we indicted Surgeon General Satcher for allowing these health discrepancies and disparities to exist. So Surgeon General Satcher agreed 
to have the first ever Surgeon General's Conference on Health Disparities for People with Intellectual Disabilities in Washington, D.C. in 2001. And that was the next turning point, I think, for healthcare for people with ID, because at that, at that uh, Surgeon General's Conference, and everybody was there, CDC, NIH, NIDCR, the LEND programs, the USEDs, uh, the, all the universities, birth, uh, birth defects, maternal child care, everybody was there. And at that meeting, after that meeting, I started to get calls from physicians all over the country. You know, Steve, uh, I'm a neurologist in New Jersey. I'm an expert in seizures. I want to work with you. I'm an anesthesiologist in, in Arkansas, and I'm an expert in craniofacial deformities. And so on and on and on. And so later that year, we formed the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And that academy has changed. In, and even though the words are medicine and dentistry, it's we have a nursing component. We have... Uh, uh, optometrists, we have uh, physical therapy, we have everybody, all the, even attorneys and social workers. Anyway, that's been the biggest turning point because now as an interdisciplinary healthcare group of all experts in the field of ID, we can tackle the issues of patients that get denied procedures because of the level of their disability, of patients that get denied transplants because of the level of disability. So all that stuff that all these um, advocacy and policy, when the National Council on Disability, on disability came to us and, as the experts in working with them, one of the biggest, the, the next biggest change that we've made is that in the dental profession, a dentist, why weren't dentists, we know there are many barriers to care, okay? There's the financial, the problems with Medicaid, stigma, uh, lack of training in dental schools, all these different things. There's about a dozen barriers to care. But the, the biggest problem was there was no education. The, the, up until this point in time, dentists only have to be trained and hygienists only in diagnosis and treatment planning. There is no hands-on requirement for the dental schools to train anybody. So what we did was working with the National Council on Disability, we got the dental profession to change the code of ethics two years ago. And now the word disability is in the code of ethics of the American Dental Association code. Therefore, now the dental schools because it's in the code of ethics, the dental schools now have the obligation to train their students in not only diagnosis and treatment planning, but hands-on. So what we're doing is really, so that's how policy and advocacy, working with a giant nonprofit um, organization can change the land. And this has really changed the landscape of healthcare delivery um, and access to care. And looking forward to what the dental schools come up with now to, uh, to, co to conform to the code of regulations. And as our nursing colleagues brought up before, I have uh, our screening program in Special Olympics is sanctioned by CDC and every screener has to be standardized according to CDC standards. So the data that I can present um, is it, it, it's, uh, and we, we run 300 screening programs a year in 150 countries. And so the screenings are, are um, because the, everybody's standardized, their reportable data is good data. And to, to join with what you ladies said, that um, the linkage of periodontal disease and the linkage of, of uh, the, the diseases, we find in, in over a quarter of a million screenings with the average age of in the mid 20s, our athletes who are supposedly healthier than most people with intellectual disabilities in the community because somebody cares about them and is taking them to train in Special Olympics. Number one, obesity is our biggest problem, but almost 50% of our athletes have periodontal disease. 15% of them are in pain at the time of competition. 15% need urgent referrals and almost 40% have active, um, visible clinical decay. So the picture of health is terrible and access to care is terrible. So we're doing everything we can in partnership with the AADMD and Special Olympics and, the, and, different, and, and Project Accessible Oral Health, which is a new program on the landscape 
Um, and we're all working together to try and end these disparities and increase access to care. Thank you, Steve, a DO physician in Chattanooga, Tennessee, who is one of my heroes, who was just appointed uh, to the uh, National Disability Council. And he's an extraordinary human being, as is Steve. And, and again, the satisfaction one gets, and, and this is to you folks out there that are watching this, listening, and learning about the facts that you've heard, and learning about the need of those individuals with special needs and those individuals that you can access in Special Olympics. If you haven't done it, please consider that as an opportunity to grow your skills and make a profound difference in your community. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, about the, how you can reach out and to different individuals to help grow your practices, grow your learning opportunities, and grow the number of patients that you have a positive impact on. You know, I don't know how many of you in the communities where you practice know the medical and nursing personnel that live there, work there, but I encourage you to reach out to them. Have a lunch and learn in your office, a piece in the healthcare profession that I think needs to have the opportunity to do their work, educate, and be reimbursed for it. You know, I marvel at the fact that Food and we talk about obesity as a critical health issue in our country. Food enters the body through the mouth, but how many oral health professionals talk about nutrition in their dental setting? It doesn't happen. Dental hygienists could do a wonderful job doing that on a Thursday afternoon and once a month, hold a nutrition class for your patients, their families to come in and learn what are the good things to eat and what are the bad things that they shouldn't eat and things like that. And and whether hopefully they're reimbursed, it, that's changing. I think we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on. I think, you know, one of the things I learned from a visit to the University of Buffalo is they have social workers working with their dental students. So I came back into the dental school I started. I was on the School of Dentistry and Oral Health. I called up the school social work department of Arizona State University. And next thing you know, I've got a social worker on my faculty working with my students because people come to your office with other issues and and you have an opportunity to really make a difference and to learn about their needs and to be a leader in that community though that may not be what you had thought about when you started learning about dentistry learning about hygiene or nursing or what have you but you have a unique opportunity as a respected caring provider that can influence your community influence the patients you serve and the professions you are a part of. So please take that home with you. I'm going to stop now and then we'll uh, get our Rick Rader video done and then we'll have a little wrap up session. I want to thank uh, Judy, Aaron and Steve for their terrific presentations. I don't know if either any one of them have anything they'd like to add that they may uh, they may at this moment if they feel they'd like to. If not, we'll turn this back over to Courtney. Okay, Judy, is that you? Yes, yes my dear. I would like to, uh, apropos of your point, Jack, about lunch and learns, I think um, telehealth or teledentistry really has become more of age since the pandemic began. And I think that that is a wonderful way to do exactly what you've said with uh, families from primary care and dental care. Um, and it's a great opportunity to um, host uh, Zoom webinars focusing on health literacy related to the areas of mutual interest and care for all of us. And whether it's obesity, diabetes, um, care of children or adults with special needs. I mean, the craniofacial team, Steve and Jack, was really the first model for interprofessional care that united dentistry, medicine, nursing, social work um, around the needs of that child, children's group with special needs. Um, so I think we should take this as encouragement to move forward in a collaborative way and take advantage of technology to move the needle 
um, on this issue. Great, great point. All of you that are watching and listening, innovation has got to be part of your future. You know, the dental practice, the nursing practice, what it was uh, now and a few years ago is not what it's going to be <laughs> in 2025. I promise you that, you know, and we're going to see drastic changes and I hope they're all for the best. You know, it's, I can't say it's a new normal, but it's going to be new and then hopefully it'll be effective and hopefully each of you will be a key part of that. I just want to take a moment to really thank uh, Judy, Aaron, and Steve. I think Judy and Aaron really made it clear how important the medical and full healthcare community is in the uh, evolving of oral health into overall health and the role that they play. And again, please take away from their wonderful presentation that reach out to the uh, medical community, to the nurses, nurse practitioners that have an opportunity opportunity to help you provide the highest quality empathetic care to the patients you serve. Steve, thank you so much for your leadership in the special needs and special Olympics community. And again, those watching and listening, realize the opportunities you have to become engaged in Special Olympics, whether at the local level, the World Games, so that you can play a role. And though many of you may not have training dealing with special needs, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Misha Gary, from the, the Orange Grove Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, is going to share with you some of her insights and experience of over five years working there with special needs patients on how you can effectively contribute to the overall health and oral health of these special needs patients, even though you may not have received the formal training in your dental education. So it's really a treat to have uh, Dr. Gary uh, join us and give you a presentation that I think for those out there that are dentists, hygienists, uh, or other mid-level providers, it's an opportunity to really uh, learn how you can play a role, even though you didn't think you could. So please, let's welcome uh, Dr. Gary. Take it away. Hey, and welcome. I'm Dr. Misha Gary. Um, I have a private practice, and I also work here on patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities at the Orange Grove Center in Chattanooga. Um, like most of you, I did not have any formal training at all to see this patient population. I kind of learned along the way from the patients themselves and from their caretakers, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, while I was building up my own private practice, I came here to see patients to help supplement my income, but I found out that it was something amazing that um, really makes you feel good and you can help others. Um, most of what I accomplish can be accomplished by all general dentists in their private practice. Um, all you have to do is have some commitment and make some small accommodations and have a patient-centered focus. While there are certain bits of knowledge that you need to know about developmental disabilities, the reality is that basic dental, it's basic dental care with a twist. The twist is appreciating diverse types of communication, behavioral prompts, sensory sensitivities, and you need to be able to reassure and be patient with your patients. The rewards far outnumber the challenges though, and at least for me, it continues to fortify the whole reason that I'm a dentist in the first place. Um, as dentists, we drill teeth, we fill teeth, we polish, we seal them, we extract them, we implant them, we make crowns, we treat infections, we do all of these things to preserve teeth and preserve function for people. Um, we do it over and over and over again, day after day, until we virtually can do it blindfolded, but I don't think you should. Uh, but sometimes this repetition becomes mundane, and for some of us, boring. Treating patients with special needs helps provide a new outlet, new challenges, new approaches, and it's a chance to get re-energized and renewed and refreshed in our dentistry. So treating patients with special needs is just a great way to put some life back into your practice and your staff. Treating patients with special needs in your office is a team effort. No dentist can do it alone, no hygienist can do it alone. Um, everyone in the office has to rise to the occasion. My staff actually gets excited when they see one of these patients on the schedule and maybe even fight about who gets to see them. Um, I've been told by my regular patients that they like the idea that their dentist cares for this patient population. They like the idea that they're going to a dentist who's apparently a cut above and that they can do things that most of the other dentists won't do or can't do. I've also had the opportunity as an adjunct professor to teach dental students the basic of treating patients with special needs. Uh, I watched them evolve. They start with blank stares and in a short time they begin to have confidence and self-esteem. 
that we all hope for. Um, one story is I had a student who was here helping me treat a person and he did most of the treatment. He was getting ready to go by a practice when he graduated in Knoxville, it's about two hours away from here. And the patient that he was seeing had paid cash and driven all the way from Knoxville because every other dentist had told them no. And the student was able to see them and we could collect the cash. So there's money to be made as well. Um, the students, they were so excited and had so much joy when they could see how they could help. There are many resources that the general dentist can turn to for information about treating patients with special needs. I would urge you to check them out. Um, one resource is the AADMD, that's the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And as the name implies, it's not just for dentists, it's for all healthcare providers, like doctors and nurses and everyone. Um, there's lots of tutorials, webinars, personal assistance. Um, you can go in there and get a lot of information. There's also the SCDA, the Special Care Dental Association. Um, a group you would not normally associate with dental care is the Special Olympics. Their Special Smiles group screens athletes for oral health, educates them on taking care of their teeth, and often treats them or refers them out to providers in their area. Uh, general dentists can volunteer to help screen athletes, and it's a great, memorable way to get your feet wet by starting to see people with special needs. People with intellectual disabilities make up about 2% of the population. Why not consider having 1% of your practice being patients with special needs? The skills and attitudes that you develop working with this population will extend beyond these patients. As your general patient population ages, they will develop disabilities from illnesses, from accidents, or from getting older. You certainly don't want to abandon them and you will need to harness the skills you've learned from your patients with special needs to care for all of your patients across their lifespan. Many general dentists who treat patients with special needs are quick to share that these patients demonstrate a level of appreciation and affection that you will never see from your neurotypical patients, such as hugs and cards and thank you notes just for giving them a root canal. It often serves as a much needed reminder of what they provide to patients, and that is compassion, empathy, respect, and dignity. Some things that I've learned that have helped make me successful in being able to treat these populations um, are, I ask the caretakers and the family members, what makes this person feel rewarded? What makes them happy? What makes them successful at school? And they'll tell me tricks. Some examples of these tricks are as simple as, I have one patient who loves the smell of popcorn. So before the appointment, I pop a bag of popcorn and he can smell it in the whole room and he's able to keep um, his behavior the way that he chooses because he knows his popcorn reward is coming and the smell helps him remember. I have one patient that loves box straps. So if we have the box straps ready for them, they sit there for the whole appointment and they rub the box strap and they're able to keep their hands away from their face because they want to do a good job. They just need something else to help stimulate them. I have people who love catalogs and they'll take that fresh new wish book catalog from Sears or JCPenney's and they'll just play with it that whole time. Some other people love the sound of tin cans, baseball cards, toys but none of these things are gonna just be known to you. You have to communicate with the caretakers, you have to communicate with their staff to find out what, what helps them feel rewarded. Um, I had one patient who loved lists and his family came in and they said, oh, he's never been able to handle going to the dentist. Um, but we, you know, someone told us to come here and try. I'm like, well, what, what helps him in school? How can he go through, you know, and do his work? And I said, well, he likes lists. So I was like, okay, let's try a list. So I wrote down everything I need to do to be able to do an exam you know, open your mouth, have a little explore, have a mirror. I handed him that list, I handed him a highlighter and he let me do each thing because he highlighted it off. Well, this patient had a lot of bubbles on their teeth and I did not write that I would squirt some air on their teeth. He would not let me do that. Even though I just used the pokey instrument and I'd done everything for him, um, he wouldn't let me do that. But we were able to, after multiple visits with a list, treat him, get x-rays, clean his teeth, do simple fillings, just because he was able to see in his mind what was next. Um, some people, you just have to tell them two things in a row and they're able to be able to sit through treatment. So we say, we're going to do this, then that. Um, we get creative with x-rays and shielding. So people can't do traditional bite wings where they bite on x-rays and just you leave the room and take them. You have to figure out some ways to make that happen. Um, we figured out how to shield the staff and then we use these sensor holders to get x-rays very quickly so they don't have to tolerate a lot of things in their mouth for very long and that has shown up great. Um, frequency of recare. Most of these people have difficulty with home care, either 
um, acts like getting their mouths open or other things that limit it. So they need to be seen more often, which also means more money in your pocket in your practice. Talking about home care and how hard it is sometimes for the caretakers and family to make sure people have appropriate home care. There are adaptive devices out there. Some people can handle having their teeth brushed for 30 seconds, but you know, we want the two minutes. So there's toothbrushes with multi-heads that'll brush buckle, occlusal, and lingual all at the same time. Um, there's mechanical ones for people who do like the stimulation, and then there's other ones that, you know, manual toothbrushes. So those things exist. People who need oral rinses, but they have a high risk for aspirating it or sucking it into their lungs or swallowing it. There's little sponges on sticks that the family can use to help increase oral care. Uh, one thing that I get a lot of times people complaining about is their um, individuals biting, either biting the toothbrush or biting them. So there are um, things they can buy on the internet, little foam mouth props that you know the individual can't bite off that you can suggest and get on Amazon. Find creative ways to help the family help the patient stay even healthier. Um, in private practice, you can also use these devices to help keep from biting. You always wanna watch for biting. It's usually never intentional, but a lot of people have musculature that snaps and um, can close on you if you're not careful. We use mouth prop a lot, research that if you don't know about it. Many of the individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities have a high risk for aspiration. Um, many of them don't eat food. They have G-tubes and they're fed nourishment through that too. So you can communicate again with the caretaker and the family member about what kind of food and what textures or any or do they have. So it helps you know what your hygienist or what yourself um, can do water-wise. If you're doing a big SRP cleaning on someone, can they handle the water? What happens if there's material that falls off? Do you need high-speed suction in there at all times? Um, sometimes you'll need more than one assistant to get in there and to get it done. Um, these are patients, just like all of the patients, and I always verbalize to that patient. Even if I know that they're nonverbal, they don't talk, maybe their caretaker said they don't understand, I still talk to that person directly. Uh, I may go to their caretaker afterward to get consent or to explain post-op instructions, but I want to humanize everyone. Everyone deserves the right to hear what care they're going to have today. Um, one way we get some people to um, get used to the dentist is we desensitize them. That means that they come to the dentist more than once and they do a little bit at a time. In private practice, you can't necessarily do that money-wise because the time is money. You, you have a business, you have to get things done. So what I do is I have a policy in the office about um, what I would do, what charges there would be that aren't covered by insurance for the family if we need multiple visits to get a cleaning done or to get a filling done or whatever the treatment may be. And I communicate right at the beginning, hey, every half an hour that we're trying to clean your individual's teeth um, is X amount of dollars. And so that helps them have control of saying, I don't want my, you know, my child put to sleep. I want to try to get them used to it. And we've had great success with people who have always been operating room cases, but they're able to get x-rays and cleanings multiple times a year to help prevent the treatment that needs hospitalization. Some things do, um, but there's many things you can do that don't need it. Money, right now, especially in this time in the world, we're all trying to put butts in our chair. We're all trying to get patients, to get people to come in. Um, seeing this population helps get people in your chair. Not only are you seeing the people with special needs, but their families see how much you care for this person that every other dentist said no to. And they say, I want you to clean my teeth too. I want you to do my crowns and my fillings. I want you to do my big implant denture. And then they go to church and they say, oh, who saw little Johnny? I thought you couldn't find a dentist. And they tell them who, and then their friends come and your practice slowly starts to build. I've seen this many, many times in my own practice. Um, so you can, there's money to be made. Um, last thing, let's say you can do some things in your practice as a general dentist or a hygienist or any other staff member, but there are some things maybe you don't feel are safe to do with the patient's behavior. Have a network of referrals, have a group of other dentists who have sedation privileges in hospital or who have more training so that you never tell somebody no. Say, let's find out who can do this. Let's get your mouth healthy. Well, thanks for listening. If any of you have any questions, feel free to email me. They'll put my information on the screen there. And I hope uh, you will start seeing people with special needs in your practice.